Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's um, meeting of the North Carolina Native Plant Society Southern Piedmont Chapter. As you know, because you registered for this meeting, we're, we're hosting Will Stewart with um, Butterflies of the Carolinas. My name is Beth Davis, and I'm co-chair of the Southern Piedmont Chapter of the Native Plant Society, along with Lisa Tompkins. And we're so glad everyone has joined us today. We've got a big group and we're really grateful to Amy Tipton and the staff of the UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden for co-hosting with us and allowing us to have such a large group today. Um, and we're grateful to all of you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Our mission is to conserve, educate, protect, propagate, and um, membership is very affordable and goes a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to present programs like this. So we are grateful for all of those who are members, encourage, um, encourage you to join and support our work. I'm gonna pass this meeting off now to Amy Tipton, Assistant Director of the UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden, and who is also a board member of the North Carolina Native Plant Society. And we are so grateful for all her hard work uh, setting up today's meeting and hosting with us. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a co-sponsor. This is really a treat. And um, this is the second monthly meeting we've co-sponsored and we hope to do many more in the future. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we offer at the Botanical Gardens. Uh, we have a certificate of native plant studies, which includes all kinds of classes about native plants, including um, care classes, gardening classes, identification classes, and then uh, also classes about ecology, botany, and, um, and other species outside of plants that utilize native plants, similarly to Will's talk today. Um, the certificate is, it's not necessary to, uh, to work toward a certificate to take those classes. If anyone would like to just take a few or one of the classes, you're more than welcome to do that. We also have uh, fall and spring native plant sales and we have one coming up um, for our members that opens um, later on this week and then for non-members the following week. And we'll give details about the dates for that um, and a link in the chat. And then one of the most beautiful parts of the garden that I really enjoy is our seven acre native woodland garden, um, which is called the Van Landingham Glen. Um, it's balanced by three acres of non-native um, ornamental cultivated gardens. Um, but I would encourage you to come to both. Um, they're really beautiful. So thank you again for allowing us to be part of today's meeting. And I second Amy's suggestion to visit the Van Landingham Glen. It is, it's, it's just um, a woodland paradise in the middle of an urban campus. So um, highly recommended. And today we are grateful to have Will Stewart talk to us about Carolina butterflies. And if you don't know of Will, um, his photographs have been published uh, in Native Plants of the Southeast, which was a book authored by Larry Melichamp. And then in the second follow-up book, The Native Plant Primer. He also contributes photographs to several sites online. And he's been photographing native wildflowers since the 70s in upstate New York. And what I find particularly unusual, but so engaging about Will's photos is that he often, he takes special care to not only photograph, in this case, butterflies, but the native plants that they frequent and then he captions and does the research and tells us so much about the plant and the insect and all of the wildlife that interact with his native plant, with our native plants. And whether or not you are a fan of Facebook or not, following Will Stewart on Facebook is like a mini ecology lesson every day as we follow him around North Carolina um, and see what he's finding blooming and foraging every day. So we are grateful to have him today and we look forward to his discussion of Carolina butterflies. Will? Well, thank you, Val. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. 
we're going to be doing some talking about North Carolina butterflies. Some butterflies, like this little elfin, appear each spring, live for a week or two, and never get far from the host planet. And they never get much attention. Monarchs are widely recognized. We all know that they are migratory, making long, complicated journeys. I watched this, ne this butterfly nectar on this lily for a full half hour. There must have been some really good nectar in there. Our butterflies pollinators. As this butterfly nectars, it gets covered with pollen. Check out those wings. The lily has a long pistil with a sticky stigma. The monarch's wings brush the stigma, perhaps transferring pollen from a distant sandhills lily. Anatomy and phenology or timing connect this plant and this butterfly. For many years, as Beth said, I've been photographing native plants. I especially like macro photography. I love the colors, I love the textures. I love the little things, I love the details. In 2007, I perched a long lens and I started photographing birds. Photography taught me a lot about birds. Our smallest warbler, the northern perula, likes to take a midday bath. My favorite subjects include birds interacting with a native plant. This scene happens every summer in our side yard. Our goldfinches love our cut leaf cone flowers. The long lens got me started with butterflies. Monarchs and milkweeds may be the best known butterfly story. Like maypops and fritillaries, monarchs and milkweeds have co-evolved. Milky sap in milkweeds contains glycosides, toxins, that help protect the plant from herbivory, but not from monarchs. Monarchs have evolved to eat milkweeds and they can sequester those glycosides. Once ingested, glycosides protect the caterpillar and later the adult butterfly, making them both toxic to predators. Monarchs, both the caterpillars and the adults, exhibit bright colors, danger signals. They're giving notice to predators. In nature, we call this aposematism. Butterflies cannot reproduce without host plants. And most host plants are native plants. Doug Talamy has taught us how butterflies benefit birds. And monarch caterpillars want to become butterflies, not bird food. It's all about relationships. It's all about the connection. So here's my plan for this afternoon. We'll spend a few minutes talking about butterfly anatomy. I'll then move on to talk about life cycles and host plants. The bulk of the presentation is an overview of the Carolina butterfly species. As we go through the species, I'll try to point out when and where I see those butterflies. And then at the end, we'll have a suggestion or two about where you can learn a little more and maybe do a little more. So how do we identify butterflies? Most butterfly identification is based on patterns and markings on the wings. Actually, if you take away the wings from a butterfly, there's not a whole lot left. All butterflies have two sets of wings. They have two form wings, they have two hind wings. This is a photo from the green swamp. As Palamedes swallowtails and nectar, their wings move constantly. Four wings move more than hind wings. It makes them tough for me to photograph. Notice that the forewings are two-toned, yellow and black, while the hindwings have beautiful bands of color. Like good wildflower books, good butterfly books, and good websites illustrate field marks, like the little yellow stripes you see on this body, or actually these three dots near the apex of the forewing. As we watch butterflies, we learn to look for field marks. Male monarchs, and only the male monarchs, have stigmata or scent patches, collections of special scales that produce pheromones. So I have a little story here about broods. This is a spice bush swallowtail. It's nectaring on sandhills flocks in its mid-April. I suspect 
it had recently emerged from its pupa, a pupa that had overwintered. All butterflies have flight periods. Flight periods are based upon broods or generations per calendar year. Some species, like this male Diana fritillary, are single brooded. Other butterflies produce three, four, even five broods per year, and they fly from early spring into late fall. At first glance, and from above, this American lady can look a little like a monarch. They do have somewhat similar coloration, but the markings are completely different. I see American ladies on Chickasaw plums in February. I see them on asters in late fall. Some adult American ladies are even seen flying on warm days in winter. Here's a different view of that same American lady. All American ladies have beautiful colors and beautiful patterns on the undersides of their wings. From above, with wings open, many of our butterflies look very different than they look in profile with their wings closed. So you might want to keep that in mind if you're shopping for a field guide. The ventral hind wing has two large, colorful eye spots. Over the next hour or so, we will see many butterflies with eye spots. Do those eye spots serve a purpose? Perhaps they confuse a predator and buy just a little bit of time for a clean getaway. The painted lady is very similar to the American lady, but most of these are migrants. In some years, large numbers of migratory painted ladies appear across the state, usually from late summer into fall, right about now. Note that these painted ladies have four smaller eye spots, where the American lady had two large eye spots. Aside from the wings, all butterflies have the same three-part anatomy. A head with a big eye, a thorax to power the wings and the legs, and an extended abdomen. A pair of antennae attached to the head, the proboscis emerges from the mouth, and pairs of walking legs attached to the thorax. During metamorphosis, the biting mouth parts of plant-eating caterpillars are replaced, replaced with the straw-like proboscis. Adult butterflies use that proboscis to sip liquids, especially nectar from flowers. Many small grass skippers have a long proboscis, making them perfectly adapted for tubular flowers. This one is on ironweed. I love watching little skippers nectar. They have great proboscis control and they're quick. Hair streaks are a group of small butterflies about the size of a penny. They often nectar upside down. As they nectar, tails wave back and forth and the little hind wings move. These motions plus the colorful hind wing markings will trick predators, trick them into attacking the wrong end of the bug. Pretty clever. Swallowtails have large showy tails. This zebra swallowtail is our only kite swallowtail. Kind of looks like a kite tail. And that picked Nancy. The red spotted purple looks like several of our dark swallowtails. But notice this butterfly has no tail. Before we discuss life cycles, let me just say every butterfly species does it a little bit differently. They all have their own unique story to tell. Yes, uh, some caterpillars have great big eye spots. This is a fifth in star, spiced with swallowtail caterpillar. They turn from green to light orange when they're fully mature. This one was on our back deck, leaving our spice bush, no doubt looking for some place to pupate to form a brown leaf-like chrysalis. Butterflies exhibit complete metamorphosis with four distinct stages, from egg to larva to pupa to adult. Butterflies use two kinds of food plants. Caterpillars feed on host plants. Many, not all butterflies, feed on nectar plants. Knowing their plants is part of knowing your butterflies. 
King's hair streaks are small. They're single booted. They fly in late spring. They never get very far from the host plant, sweet bee. And when King's hair streaks are active, when they're flying, there are very few nectar plants available where you find sweet bee. Inkberry holly is one. So when I'm looking for this butterfly, I look for its favorite plant. Red spotted purples have a flight period from April into October with three broods. This is black cherry. It's Doug Calmy's number one small tree for wildlife. This photo is from a butterfly walk in June 2019. The good old days, I think you all remember when we used to go on group walks. We watched a red spotted purple land in a cherry tree. When the butterfly flew away, we searched a little bit and we found several eggs. Red spotted purples prefer to deposit their eggs on leaf tip. A lot of butterflies have favorite places they like to deposit their eggs. This is from my side yard. Monarchs usually deposit eggs on the bristly undersides of milkweed leaves. This is from one of my favorite, favorite places. Sandals lupin is a beautiful spring wildflower. It can be common, but it's only common in longleaf pine areas that are managed by periodic burning. If you, you suppress fire, you don't get much sandals lupin. The frosted elfin is a small, uncommon butterfly. And then the sandals lupin is its primary host plant. They are single brooded. The adult flies for about two weeks from late March into mid-April. This photo was taken on March 29th. Females deposit eggs directly on the lupin flower buds. A week or so later, eggs will hatch into caterpillars who will feed on the lupin blossoms and some of the young seed pods. They go through four instars and then pupate in the leaf litter or the soil. They enter a dormant period called diapause and they spend most of the year as a pupa. So I have a question. Can a frosted elfin pupa survive a man burn? I don't think we know. I don't think we know how they are adapted to these, these hab habitats that are managed by fire. Dusky wing, a juvenile dusky wing is a common spread wing skipper. It flies in early spring, and I often have seen it on a Chickasaw plum. So I was butterflying in Chiron State Park in very early spring, and I spotted the juvenile dusky wing, and it was landing just on, on one oak after another, these naked oak branches. It was stopping at the very tips of the branches. I was wondering for a minute, and then I realized, of course, it's depositing its eggs on the young buds of the oak tree. This is from our back deck. A black swallowtail discovered our parsley, Beth, you had that happen, and left us a few eggs. We found four first instar caterpillars. As caterpillars grow, they shed their outer skins and they molt. They molt into a next instar, often changing appearance as they do. So yes, you may be adding a caterpillar field guide to your library. I see common buckeye caterpillars well into fall, even into November. Rows of dark spines may be off-putting to a predator, but they're not toxic. It may be that some common buckeye caterpillars can overwinter. Caterpillars of some species, including the eastern giant swallowtail, blend into the surroundings. <laughs> they sort of blend into the surroundings. It's the bird dropping strategy. I'm not about to repeat the entire Doug Calmy argument. He does that very, very well for himself. This brown-headed nuthatch was nesting in our side yard. We know them pretty well. They're seed eaters. They eat a ton of our seed. But when they raise young, they feed their chicks protein. They feed them bugs. Here's a prothonotary warbler from Lansford Canal with a mouthful of baby food. I'm sure some of you have raised caterpillars. 
when the caterpillars are fully grown, they stop feeding, they usually leave the host plant, and then they pupate. Some on a branch, some wrapped in a leaf, others in the soil. A chrysalis is a rigid protein exoskeleton that protects a pupa. After a period of time, maybe not until the following spring, an adult emerges from the pupa. We use the term eclose. We had a young black swallowtail male eclose uh, on Friday, and we released it yesterday, and it flew away and immediately was 30 or 40 feet up in the air. All butterflies have a four-stage life cycle, but every species has its own timing and frequency. Diapause is an interruption of that cycle. And with our climate, all species need a strategy to overwinter. Some butterflies overwinter as an egg, some as a caterpillar, quite a few as a pupa, and some as adults. And some, of course, migrate to Florida or Texas or places beyond. So with that, we could take a question on butterfly life cycle. Got a couple of those. Um, do butterflies lay eggs on vegetables in your garden? On vegetables, such as? Just your general garden vegetables. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess we'd have to say that the, the cabbage white is laying eggs on vegetables. Um, a, 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 lot, a lot of the things that, that lay eggs on your vegetables are going to be moths. And uh, unless Lenny Lampel is on the, on the, the, the uh, Zoom here, I, I, I can't take a moth question. I know almost nothing about them. I know less about moths than I know about gardening, which is hard to me. We have so, another question. Um, do butterflies like salt? Absolutely. Um, that's a long story, actually. Um, salts are very important to male butterflies uh, in enabling them to produce sperm, viable sperm. And in fact, when sperm is transferred from the male to the female, that's a way in which female butterflies take on salts. So that's a long story. and, and uh, and, and you can Google on that and you'll, you'll find all sorts of information on, on male butterflies and salts and, and reproduction and the viability of eggs even. One more question. Hmm. How does the larvae find its spot to pupate? Um, I have no idea <laughs> where and why they choose to pupate. You know, I think, I think if you go out, Beth, and you look at your parsley and you see all those black swallowtail caterpillars on there, uh -huh. they're pretty vulnerable, you know? And birds can figure that out. So I think part of getting away from the host plant is, is getting away from the obvious place. Sort of the way um, birds, when they're young, fledge, they immediately get them out of the nest and get them off to some place that's going to be um, less obvious to a, to a, to a snake that's, that's looking for a meal. So I think that's part of it. Interesting. Speculation. I'm a photographer, not an entomologist. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Thanks, Will. Okay, so here we go with a quick species overview. Our butterflies belong to six families. We're going to sample five of those families in family order. And we'll start with the swallowtail. Don't worry about the details on this slide. You're going to see this slide five more times. And I will be giving you links where you can see full species lists organized by family. There are more than 500 swallowtail species worldwide. North Carolina has eight. One of those, the Appalachian tiger swallowtail, is rare. So we're going to profile these seven. The Eastern tiger swallowtail is our most common swallowtail. They're strong flyers. Wings are a pale yellow with a dark border and four vertical dark tiger stripes. There's no similar butterfly. This one happens to be a male. This is a tiger swallowtail female. She has the same yellow ground color 
the same dark wing borders and the same for tiger stripes. Females, unlike males, have a bright blue band at the base of their hind wing. Dimorphic means two distinct forms, males and females exhibiting different colors or different markings. Many of our butterfly species are sexually dimorphic. Okay, are we ready for polymorphic? Some tiger swallowtail females, and only the females, are a dark moor or a dark form eastern tiger. They look quite different from the yellow form, and they're actually easily confused with other dark swallowtails. All tiger swallowtail females do have that same, same blue band at the base of the hind wing. And while the colors here look very different, on the underside, all tiger swallowtail females have a single row of orange half moons at the margin of the hind wing. A single row at the margin. Here's a second dark swallowtail. The pipeline swallowtail is a bit smaller than the tiger. It has a row of seven orange spots on the ventral hind wing but it's not, they're not at the wing margin, and these spots are circles. Plus that iridescent blue background is unique to this butterfly. This photo is from the Blue Ridge Parkway, where pipe vine is very common roadside vine. Pipe vine swallowtails are much more numerous in the mountains. The flower looks like a little curved pipe and hides beneath the leaf. Turks cap lilies bloom in the blue, on the, along the Blue Ridge Parkway in early July, just as pipe vine swallowtails begin their largest brood. On sunny days, I've seen dozens of fresh pipe vine swallowtails mobbing a patch of lilies, as they're doing here. They often nectar with closed wings. Again, look at that single row of seven bright orange circles on an iridescent blue hind wing. The dorsal wing surface of a female pipe vine swallowtail is dark with pale white spots. There's, there's not a whole lot going on there. Now the hind wings do often show just a hint of blue. Hind wings of males are similar, but they have an iridescent blue sheen. It almost looks like somebody took a little kind of spray paint and just sprayed the, that blue on there. The spice bush swallowtail is our third dark swallowtail. This butterfly is very common in the Piedmont, where the host plant, spicebush and sassafras, are common. Lower sections of these hind wings are light blue, actually more greenish in, in males, and the trailing edge of the hind wing has a row of large, pale blue half moons. Look at that hind wing and look for those large, pale blue half moons, and, and you'll be an expert on spicebush swallowtail identification. The underside of the hind wing has a double row of orange spots separated by a blue band. The inner row of orange is interrupted, interrupted by a little point of blue. Someone told me that this looked like a Nike swoosh. So my number one go-to field mark, if I get to the underside of the wing, is that blue swoosh. Here's a puddle party. It's a dozen or so spice for swallowtails, <clears throat> probably males, picking up some of those minerals we talked about earlier. Many butterflies spend much of their day in crowded little groups, sipping moisture and salts. This black swallowtail is our fourth and final confusing dark swallowtail. <clears throat> this one is a female. The best field mark, look for that orange circle surrounding a dark center at the base of the hind wing. And I'm sure many of you have seen this caterpillar on your parsley. <clears throat> That's a black tail caterpillar. And as we said before, uh, they like members of the carrot family as host plants. The black tail is another sexually dimorphic species. The female is on the left. The male with that bright yellow band of irregular spots is on the right. The handsome butterfly. 
Here's a side by side. We're not going to do this with all the butterflies. Here's a side by side for the black swallowtail and the spice bush swallowtail. They're often seen in the same habitat. Here they're on the same plant. Look for this round white spot at the apex of the forewing. Only the black swallowtail has this. And of course, look for that signature orange circle around the black center. And then notice that spice bush swallowtail has those pale blue half moons. Here are the same two species with closed wings. They look a lot alike. But again, I look for that, that blue swoosh. So we are done with confusing dark swallowtail. <clears throat> the next three swallowtails are a lot easier to identify. Zebra swallowtails have white and black vertical zebra stripes. The long slender tails on those long wings make these numbers of the kite swallowtails. This one stopped in post me on Papa, and that's quite a few years ago. I've only seen this once. I was walking down a GTR road in the PD, and I found a pair of mated zebra swallowtails. With wings closed, those wings look like triangles. They nectar like that often, wings held in that triangular position, little triangles with tails. These are beautiful butterflies. Pawpaws are their only host plants. We saw the Palamedes swallowtail earlier. This butterfly is usually found in the sand hills and along the coast where the red bays, their host plants, are common. I do see them once in a while um, um, showing up out of rain, but they're usually near, near the red bay. These butterflies are large, graceful. They kind of tend to float on the breeze as they, as they fly by. I photographed this eastern giant swallowtail in the New River Valley in Ashe County, thanks to Gene Wilson, actually, an area where the host plant Telia or wafer ash is common. Gene has Telia in her yard. Peak flight for this butterfly in the New River Valley is late August into September, right about now. Stray giant swallowtails will show up in gardens about this time of year. And they like to nectar on non-native like lantana, so be on the lookout. I think somebody reported one in Charlotte about 10 days ago. The giant swallowtail's underwing are light yellow. It's a handsome butterfly. And that blue background is the new river. I think that's probably my favorite butterfly photo of 2020 so far. Maybe I'll get one tomorrow that I'd like more. So with that, let's take a question or two on swallowtail butterflies. Hey, Will, how do you get the butterflies to sit still for your photography? By spending half my life out there. <laughs> um, a, a lot of them don't want to sit still. Black swallowtail males constantly, their wings are in constant motion. The same is true for Palmetes swallowtails. Um, Tiger swallowtails, uh, they're much more cooperative. They, they, they're a little lazier about flapping their wings when they're nectaring. But I actually have found, if I find a newly eclosed butterfly, it wants to nectar and it'll ignore me. That happened to me this year with black swallowtails. Um, usually very, very active. Uh, I was, I was um, um, going back and forth on a big patch of, of narrow leaf mountain mint which is a good place to find those butterflies. And I'm sure it was a, a, a butterfly that he closed that, that day. And I was probably four feet from the butterfly and it just nectared and nectared and nectared and ignored me. And in the previous photo, what non-native was the giant swallowtail on? Somebody's asking. In the mountains, um, the, the host plant is Telia trifoliata. On the coast, it's a Xanthoxylum. Um, so those are both in the same family. They're similar plants. But, but um, that, that's an interesting distribution of this butterfly because it's only found near its, its host plant and the host plant, the host plants are different and, and, and they're separated geographically. So we, if, if you see one of these butterflies here in Charlotte, it, it's probably a stray. 
if that makes sense. And then we had one other question. Um, why are this, why were the swallowtails so late this year? That's a very, very good question. It has been a very strange year. Um, I, I monitor a listserv. So I, I see people who are out butterflying every day. So I was seeing a, a more reliable stream of information, I think. Some people on Facebook were saying we were having a butterfly apocalypse, that there were no butterflies now and there never will be again. Um, and, and, and as it turned out, we were having kind of a butterfly explosion in uh, late August into September. Um, I think a lot of it was the rainy, wet weather we had this spring. But again, it, you know, it varies by species. I, I always find lots of spice bush swallowtails. I could not find one in July. And then suddenly, turn the calendar, August 1st, I was finding them by the dozens. We ready to move on? Let's go. I'm sorry? Yeah, let's move on. Here we go. Okay. Okay, let's take a quick look at a second family the sulfurs and whites. And we're not gonna spend anywhere near as much time on these other butterflies as we spend on the, the swallowtails, which are very common butterflies. Here we see several sulfurs. The largest butterfly in this photo is a cloudless sulfur. Many of our sulfurs commonly puddle and most will nectar frequently. All the sulfurs are yellow and most of them have minimal marking. Cloudless sulfurs are very common the bright to pale to a lemon yellow, and they only have a few scattered markings on their wings. Females do have slightly stronger markings. I caught this cloud the sulfur just taking off, and that enables me to see there are no dark borders on, that, on the wings. So that's why it's called cloudless. Sleepy orange butterflies are smaller, more orange, and have no eye spots. I just had two of those in my side yard uh, an hour ago. The name sleepy refers to their closed eyes, so they do not have open eye spots. The dark mar margin on dorsal wing surface uh, is not visible when those wings are closed. And here you see a typical puddle party of, of sleepy oranges. Uh, if I go down by the PD River, um, I, I can find a hundred sleepy oranges in a puddle. The orange sulfur is a little larger than a sleepy orange. I look for distinct open eye spots. This butterfly is yellow with some orange on its dorsal wing surfaces. Colors do vary, so some of them almost have no orange at all. With little backlight, I can see that the wings do in fact have a, have a black border. This is a rare member of the sulfurs, a southern dog face. It is very similar in size, color, and markings to both orange and clouded sulfurs. So I have a little question here. Do we all see a dog's face there? Little yellows are perhaps an inch across. These are very common where sensitive partridge pea is common. I, when I get down to the sand hills uh, tomorrow, I'll find 200 of those. These two little dots at the base of the hind wing are a pretty reliable field mark. This is a European species. It's not native, and it's our most common white butterfly. We see it in fields, we see it in gardens. The dorsal wing surfaces are white with one or two dark spots on the forewing. Actually, one dark dot for males and two for females. Populations are on the decline, probably due to pesticide use, certainly due to development, loss of agricultural land. They do have a light yellow wash on the undersides of the wings. Uh, cabbage and broccoli and mustards are their host plants. If you happen to be in the Smoky Mountains in spring, you may see a pure white butterfly with no markings at all. These are West Virginia whites. They're single booted and they use two thirds as host plants and they use two thirds as nectar plants. And I need to get a better photo of a West Virginia white. Here's another white, the checkered white. And this one is a native, 
It's about the same size as cabbage white. Due to its name, the wings have something a little black and white checkered appearance. This species is uncommon. I think it's a beautiful butterfly. And my favorite member of this group is the falcate orange tip. Uh, the falcate orange tip is a single brooded spring butterfly. It only flies in March and April. The Canal Trail in Lansford Canal State Park is a perfect place to see this butterfly. I would say 1st of April would be an ideal time to go. Host plants are cresses and toothworts, and both of those grow along that trail. And that trail also has spring beauties. I always look for the species nectaring on spring beauties. Only the males have the bright orange tips on their forewings. So the female, just a white wing, kind of a dirty un underwash on the, uh, wash on the underside, and the male with the bright orange tip. So next family. The Lycinidae, or the Gossamer wing, are a family of 6,000 species worldwide. We only have 26. They are small, colorful, and interesting. Some species associate with ants. Some caterpillars actually produce honeydew, honeydew to feed the ants and keep the ants hanging around. There are lots of good stories that we won't get into today. <clears throat> we have four subfamilies in North Carolina. Hair streaks and elfins are mostly uncommon and they're mostly popular with people like me. I get really excited about elfin season. This brown elfin is often my first butterfly of spring. They fly in, fe about in late February. They're only about the size of a nickel. Some of our populations are associated with little leaf pixie moss, which they use as a nectar plant, and there's nothing else to nectar on that time of year. So they're taking a chance when they pop out in, in, in February that they're gonna find a, something to nectar on and, and pixie moss is their meal. In the Sandhills blueberries, maybe their primary host plant. These little butterflies are tougher than you might think. Uh, they, they fly when it's 55 degrees and, and bigger, bigger, bolder butterflies are, are, are not coming out. I love hair streaks. Hair streak species are identified by the colors and patterns on the forewings and hindwings. I had a little gray hair streak on my goldenrod in my side yard this morning. The broad red bands you see on this butterfly make identification pretty easy. I guess it made naming it pretty easy, didn't it? I see red banded hair streaks in my yard on various native plants. I see, I see them on joe pie, I see them on, on various cone flowers, um, and here you see it on tai tai. Tai tai is a nice butterfly plant. This butterfly had fresh white tipped tails that were waving non stop as it nectared, upside down, of course. And uh, check out this color scheme. Every color but purple. The great purple hair streak is our only tropical hair streak. I think its range goes down into Panama. In North Carolina, the only known host plant is mistletoe. Members of the blues are small, small, a centimeter or two, which makes them easy to overlook. Dorsal wing surfaces are mostly pale blue to gray. I took a little walk through my neighborhood uh, about two hours ago, and I just saw just a little tiny eastern tail blue flying across a lawn. And as I say, maybe, maybe a third of an inch across. So this is a little story. I was on a hiking trail in Bosca del Patch, New Mexico, and I spotted this tiny butterfly on a small purple aster. Actually, there were several of them. And there was no one around. So I had my long lens and I just lay down flat on the trail and started photographing the butterflies. And of course, a couple came along and looked at me very, very strangely. I don't know if they reported me to the ranger or not. I just kind of pointed at the butterflies and they just kind of shook their heads and kept on going. Um, North Carolina doesn't have blues that are quite this interesting or pretty, but we do have lots of azures. And our state azures are very common butterfly. We have five species. The azures, the dorsal wing surfaces, are shades of blue 
to gray. Wing undersides are mostly brownish gray, pale gray, with dark gray markings like you see here. Spring azures and summer azures are the two most common azures. Uh, they're separate species, but they look identical. Nobody can, nobody can tell them apart. And here's a puddle party of summer azures on the banks of the Green River in Polk County. And I, I just said nobody can tell them apart. Um, this was late enough so that, so that spring azures should not be flying at this time of year. And here's an eastern tail blue. Some of you probably know this butterfly. Very, very common, but they're very small and they're easy to overlook. Uh, legumes, both native and non-native, are host plants. Uh, so there are lots of Lespedeza in, in the sand hills, and so I see lots of eastern tail blues. Note that they have these little tails and, and a pair of orange spots on the hindwing margin. You might need binoculars to, to see them. Or maybe that's just me with my old eyes. And here we see an open wing view of an eastern tail blue. I sometimes see dozens of them on, on, a, on a damp or dry uh, dirt or gravel road. Cobbers are a large group. They're mostly western butterflies. But I had to share this one. It's such a pretty butterfly. We have this one copper species, the American copper. We usually see it in the mountains. I found this one near Doton Park. And it's usually seen disturbed by successional habitats. It likes pastures, vacant lots. So with that, we'll take a question or two on sulfurous flights or gossamer wing butterflies. I have a more general question. What flower shape or type of flower are butterflies most commonly nectaring on? Well, they, they, they have these, these long tongues and actually the proboscis length varies tremendously from one species to the next. So I think the choice of nectar plant um, depends to a great extent on, on the butterfly's anatomy. The little skippers have proboscises. That's not the correct word, is it? They have very long proboscises, uh, longer than the length of the whole body. So they love iron weeds. Uh, Carfefris is about to bloom. Carfefris is my favorite part of the year because all these little skippers with their little long tongues are just perfectly designed to feed on Carfefris. I don't know if that's enough of an answer or not. Probably had, all, it's probably all I know about that question. I had a quick question. Um, are the gossamer wings the only butterflies with the black and white banded antennae? No, um, that, that's, 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 that, that's a good question. And it's something you don't see very much in field guides. I was out looking at uh, dotted skippers last week and uh, um, of course, only, only butterflies have clubs on their antennae. Uh, moths do not. And, and uh, the markings on antennae and the, and the color of the antenna clubs can, can be very useful as, as a field mark. You don't see a lot of it in field guides. So maybe I'm just making that up. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. We only have one metal mark, and it's a rare butterfly, and it's coastal, and I've never seen one, and so we're going to move on. This is a big family. Uh, it has seven subfamilies, and we're going to try to cover seven subfamilies in about seven minutes. This is our first look at an angle wing. What makes this butterfly a brushwood? It only has four legs that we can see. Actually, the front pair of legs are very small, brush-like, and they're used for tasting or smelling, not for walking. Brushfoots, like this monarch, are sometimes called four-footed butterflies. The first group is called true brushfoots, and it includes several of our common species. We have four species of angle wings. <clears throat> All of them have these scalloped wing margins. 
I find Polygonia as I walk dirt and gravel roads, especially through a hardwood forest. Undersides of the wings, as you see here, look kind of like a dead leaf. Two common species, the eastern common and the question mark, are named for the small white punctuation marks you see on the hindwing. This one is a question mark. And this one is an eastern common. We'll do a little replay here. We go back and we look at the question mark and you see the little point at the end of the curve there. In the comma, we just see the, the little curved line. When they open their wings, they're beautiful copper colored butterflies. Actually, this is a, a, a summer coloration. In the spring, they don't have that black on their hind wings. They're, they're a little more washed out than that. Both the Eastern comma and the question mark have this row of spots on the forewing. But it took me a while to figure this out. And, and, and I should have figured out earlier, but only the question mark has this fourth spot. The question mark versus comma, four spots on the question mark, three on the comma. Common buckeyes are found in fields, roadsides, lawns. I'm sure you've seen them in your gardens. They have several broods from spring into late fall. No other butterfly looks like a buckeye. They have those brown wings with orange and tan markings and those big, big colorful eye spots. That's how they got that name buckeye. Pearl crescents may have five broods in a year. These butterflies are small, maybe two inches across. They're very common. They'll nectar on almost anything. I found, uh, I found the Michaud's sumac with flowers on it and it had about 30 little pearl crescents mobbing the, the, the sumac blossoms. This photo is a little too small for this, I apologize, but the dark spots along that hind wing margin are solid or filled, solid black dots. And I point that out because silvery checker spots look very similar to those crescents. They're a little bit larger, but they have silvery centers in those spots along the hind wing. And North Carolina is actually home to several checker spot species. We covered the ladies earlier. Both the American and painted ladies are four-footers, they're true brushfoots. And another member of that same species is the red admiral. Pardon me, another member of the same genus in this boat. Uh, the red admiral is, is black and orange and it's, it's quite showy. I see red admirals puddling in wet places. They can be seen almost anywhere. Uh, it doesn't nectar very frequently. I happen to catch it nectaring on a, on a Joe Pye leaf. Satyrs and wood nymphs are a group of brushfoots that are shades of brown with prominent eye spots. Most of these are weak flyers. Many of them avoid sunlight, and most of them rarely nectar. We have three species of pearly eye. None of them are very common. Uh, the southern pearl eye is the most common of the three. Their host plant is river cane, and I never see a pearly eye unless I'm somewhere near cane. Pearly eyes feed exclusively on sap or decaying fruit. They do not nectar. Common wood nymphs have a nickname. <laughs> They're called goggle eyes. Those Eye spots on that cream colored forewing are unmistakable. Nothing looks quite like that. Um, these butterflies fly pretty low to the ground and they rarely nectar. But I do see them nectaring on Laetris at Doton Park. I don't know why, but they do. Uh, if you have not been to Doton Park in mid July um, with that wildflower meadow that has, I don't know, 10,000 uh, Laetris blooms. Uh, it, it's a wildflower show. Uh, it's, a, it's a butterfly show. Although this year, it wasn't the show it usually is. Carolina satyrs are small, 
and very common along woodland trails. <clears throat> they prefer wet places where they fly low and erratically. Uh, I, I can never get a photo of one, they just never sit still, uh, which is why I got a picture of them when, when they were a mated pair. Um, when they're flying like that, they're probably trying to escape a dragonfly. They're, they're sort of the perfect size meal uh, for, for a dragonfly lunch. Grasses are their host plants. Long wings are a showy group of butterflies. And the long wing group includes all of our fritillaries. I included this zebra long wing from South Carolina just to show you that, that very long wing. And this butterfly is actually a close relative to our Gulf fritillary. The Gulf fritillary is a migratory butterfly. It usually arrives in North Carolina in late summer. In some, some years, they're very, very common on fall wildflowers. But most of the Gulf fritillaries we see are migrants, migrants from the south. Now, they, they, they do breed here, um, sort of a late summer brood using may pops in fields. Uh, so, so you want to look in areas where you find passion vines if, if you're looking for breeding uh, Gulf fritillaries. Um, many of these butterflies will migrate back south and overwinter as adults. It's a showy aposematic species. Here's the underside of a Gulf fritillary wing. Uh, they have these bright white markings, bright spangles. It's a pretty butterfly. When they fly, you often see almost, almost a silvery uh, appearance. In the Piedmont, the variegated fritillary is our most common fritillary. This butterfly is multi-brooded, like other fritillaries, unlike other fritillaries, and it flies from March into December. I look for this butterfly on, in fields. Both passion vines and violets are host plants. It can be, can be confused with the great spangled fritillary, but I look for that pale mark midway on the forewing, and also this pale band on the forewing. Uh, you will not see that on a great spangled fiddler. If you get to see the underside of the wing, you can see the very good fiddler has, has, has a camouflage pattern. In the mountains, great spangled fiddler are our most common fiddler. They're a bit larger than variegated fiddler. And here we see a male with that rich golden color. It's a beautiful butterfly. A great spangled fritillary is single brooded and uses various violets as host plants. Actually, the females kind of deposit their eggs in the vicinity of the violets and the, the, uh, the, the eggs hatch, but the first end star caterpillars overwinter. And then it's not until the following spring that they, they feed on the violets. It's kind of an interesting story. With wings closed, you get to see the spangles on the great spangled fritillary. It has two rows of silvery white triangles and circles separated by that, by that buffy band. We have three milkweed butterflies. You might guess one of them. The monarch, the queen, and the soldier. The queen and the soldier are unusual in North Carolina, mostly coastal, and both of those are monarch lookalikes. Take a good look at the veins on the hind wing of this monarch because this is the viceroy. And we all know the viceroy is a well-known monarch lookalike, a mimic. Uh, viceroys are more common in wetter areas, areas where you find willows, their host plants. Um, no problem identifying a voice story if you just remembered that they have that curved arc on the hind wing that will identify the voice for you. We only have two admiral species, the viceroy and a second member of the same genus, the black spotted purple, which we saw before. Here you see it nectar, which it doesn't do very often. 
can see the underside of the wings and you can see why it's called the red spotted purple. Uh, the red spotted purple is thought to be a mimic of the pipe vine swallowtail. So both of our admiral species are considered to be mimics. We have two emperors, both similar in appearance and similar in behavior. I see hackberry emperors as I walk forest roads. Um, Usually they see me first and, and they fly off. They're, they're tough to, to photograph. The hackberry emperor is always found near toast plant hackberries. This butterfly does not nectar. It does have a habit of landing on leaves. It also has a habit of landing on people, especially sweaty people or kids. So, so that can be a great butterfly experience for a young boy or girl to be walking down a forest road and have the hackberry emperor land, land on his or her shoulder. So look for that if you're, if, if you're a person who takes the kids out hiking. And our last brush foot. Uh, nothing looks like a snout. You can see where it got its name. That long snout is actually a pair of up along mouth parts or palps. Like, like emperors, snouts can be very common where you find hackberries. And like emperors, they too will fly circles around my head uh, and sometimes they land on me. I usually see them, see them puddling or, or perched. So with that, we can take a question or two on, on brushwoods. We don't have any questions about Brushfoot specifically, but there was a question about basic uh, differences between butterflies and moths. Um, what are the key things to look for? Um, the easiest thing to look for is is the is the antennae. Uh, a number of our moths, and again, I am no moth person, but a number of our moths have feather-like antennae like you see on the Luna moth, great big feathery thing. Others just have very long, slender, filamentous antenna. So a lack of antenna clubs is, is a key thing I look for. Um, when we first started the presentation, I talked about forewings and hindwings. In the moths, those, those, the forewings and hindwings are hooked together like they are in some bees. Um, so you do not see separate motion of four wings and hind wings with moths. Um, I guess moths tend to have a fuzzier body than a butterfly. Again, Lenny Lampel or, or a moth person will be a better person to answer that question. So we made it to the skippers, and that's our last butterfly family. So we, we would need a half day to explore the skippers. There are a lot of them. Uh, they're hard to tell apart. Most of our skippers are either spread wing skippers or grass skippers. The general rule, spread wing skippers nectar with their, open, with their wings open. Not always the case, but that's kind of the general rule. And another general rule is that grass skippers tend to nectar with their wings closed. So here's a typical looking spread wing skipper, and that's the way it usually nectars. In North Carolina, we have more than half a dozen dusky wing species. All the dusky wings are light to dark brown, and they have subtle differences in those wing markings. Some of them are really tough to tell apart. Even experienced butterflyers will debate with one another about which dusky wing species they're looking at. I often see a dusky wing on my Joe Pie or on an aster in my side yard. Many of you know this butterfly. This is the silver spotted skipper. It's a frequent garden visitor. This butterfly usually nectars the way you see it here with mostly closed wings. And when it does, you see that large white patch on the underside of the hind wing. So a very active butterfly on the Blue Witch Parkway, I've seen 30, 40, 50 in a group um, spread out across dogbane, for example. They like dogbane. The 
This is the long-tailed skipper. It's a large spread wing skipper with a very distinctive long tail. So you're getting a double dose of long-tailed skipper just because I'd like to photograph this bug. Uh, it's migratory and numbers peak about this time of the year. I think Lisa Tompkins had one three weeks ago, a while ago. Uh, it's a great garden visitor, I think. I think it's a beautiful little butterfly. And this is a typical profile of a grass skipper. Most grass skippers are small. Some of them are very small. I found a southern skipperling a couple of weeks ago. It's tiny. The wings of grass skippers are often tightly closed, forming a little triangle like you see here. And identifications can be tricky. So if you like confusing fall asters, you will love confusing fall skippers. We even have a group of little brown bugs that are called the witches, which is sort of a clever little name for them. The witches like to land on confusing fall asters. And this witch happens to be a, a little glassy wing. That's, that's one of the witches. Um, so butterflies like to debate about which witch is which, or which witch they're looking at. Fiery skippers don't fall into that category. They're pretty easy to identify. Fiery skippers are very common. I saw two of them uh, on my, my uh, goldenrod before this talk. By July 1st, I always have a few in my yard. Here we see a light colored male pursuing a female. It's a very common sight when you see fiery skippers. Many of our skippers are sexually dimorphic. A number of grass skippers kind of gradually open their wings with their hind wings extended and the fore wings pointing up at, at like a 45 degree angle, sometimes called the jet plane position in some books. When they do that, they reveal uh, hidden field marks. Field marks you can't see when their wings are closed. And those hidden field marks help with identification. Uh, this is Dahlia pinata season, and Dahlia is probably probably at peak bloom today. I'll probably I'll probably check it out tomorrow, and I may find a skipper or two on the Dahlia. I like Dahlia. Here's a mesty skipper, pretty skipper, giving me just a little bit of a glance at that dark upper forewing, and that helps to identify this bug. Uh, I actually spent the whole day looking for that skipper. So you drive at resources. So if you'd like to learn more about butterflies, here are some of my favorite resources. Harry Legrand uh, must have 30 or 40 hours in his day. He gets so much stuff done. Uh, Harry is the owner of the North Carolina State Parks Butterfly website. On that website, you will find a profile of every North Carolina butterfly. You'll find photos. You'll find discussions of host plants. You can find a map uh, showing every sighting of that butterfly by county in North Carolina for the past 30 years. It, it's an amazing piece of work. There is another um, state parks page Emerge and Fly. I think they did it in 2014 for a celebration. Um, poke around in there. Uh, there are lots of activities there. There are activities for kids. There are color pages, etc. Uh, quality varies. Some of the stuff is, is real good. Some of it is it, it, so good. Jeff Piven is probably the dean of North Carolina Butterflyers. He has all sorts of natural history on his website. And he has thousands of butterfly images. So if I have a butterfly and I'm trying to learn a little more, more about it, I go to Jeff Pippen's page and I, I check out his images of a butterfly. And Will Cook has an equally good website. Uh, he has all sorts of natural history on his website, Carolina Natural, um, from plants to birds to butterflies and more. 
If you want to get involved, the Carolina Lutz Listserv is a way for you to submit your butterfly sightings from across the state. Uh, Jeff Pippen is the owner of that listserv. Uh, you can go to Carolina Leps and sign up for that. If you decide you don't want to see all those emails, you can you can you can uh, take yourself off the, the listserv. Um, people on that on that listserv report their sightings by day, by county, and all those sightings get recorded in a database, and that ends up on the state parks website. So it's it, it's pretty neat. Here are my two go-to butterfly books. They're both by Jeffrey Glassberg. He's probably the best known butterfly author. Uh, all the identification in there is by photographs and he likes to point out the various little field marks. <coughs> and of course, if you're looking to add native to your yard, this is, this is the book to go to. Uh, you've seen my butterfly heroes. Uh, Paul and Larry are my, my native plant heroes. Uh, they've really done the, the, the how to to get Calamese, why should you? Um, Paul and Larry are two very strong voices helping you add more natives to your landscape. So thank you very much.